Hey, my name is uh, Carolyn Cherry. I am the hatchery operation uh, coordinator for the Hill and Aquaculture Association. And what I'm going to do today is give you a brief overview of what the Hill and Aquaculture does, and then to look at two of our brew stock programs where we uh, use the ability of the uh, sockeye salmon to return to their home and native streams uh, to uh, alleviate some of the issues we have with some of our broodstock uh, collections. <coughs> uh, Cook Inlet Aquaculture was established in 1976. Uh, we're located in uh, South Central Alaska, so we're above where Trent is up in Kodiak, we're just above him. Um, the area is quite large. Uh, we cover the entire lower and uh, upper Cook Inlet as well as all the freshwater drainage that goes into those areas. So it is quite a large area. Uh, it does include a number of uh, entities, or government entities, the Matsu and the Kenai Peninsula Borough, as well as the uh, major cities of Seward, Homer, uh, Kenai, Salvatan area, and uh, also Anchorage. Uh, the mission of, port, or of Cook Inlet Aquaculture is to protect and rehabilitate salmon stocks and habitat and then also to maximize the common property resource back to uh, Oak Inlet. Uh, initially when Cook Inlet uh, started, we were focused on uh, habitat projects. Uh, we were dealing with beaver dam removals, uh, flow control structures, uh, fishways, and then we had this one hatchery up at uh, Kalubna, up near Anchorage, uh, where we were doing some uh, enhancement projects from. Uh, since then, we've grown uh, mainly on our uh, hatchery programs. Uh, we now have four hatcheries in total. Uh, two of them are pink salmon hatcheries, and those are located down here at the uh, Tutka Bay uh, Lagoon Hatchery. Uh, it's uh, permitted for 125 million pink salmon. And Port Graham Hatchery, which is our newest acquisition in 2014, is also permitted for 125 million uh, pink salmon. Uh, the Kalunda Salmon Hatchery right now is not, is not operational. Uh, there's limited ability in the Upper Cook Inlet Aquaculture for some enhancement projects, mainly do some uh, mixed stock and wild stocks already being in the area. Uh, we're hoping that we can use um, the Tuck Bay and Port Graham uh, returns to fund the reopening of this and look at uh, using the Kalunda Hatchery as more of a rehabilitation rather than an enhancement <coughs> program. The last uh, uh, facility is uh, Trill Lakes. Uh, this is the sockeye facility that I'll go into a little bit more detail with. Uh, the Tutka and the Trill Lakes uh, hatcheries are both state-owned, and Klutna and Port Graham Cook Inlet both <coughs> owns and operates those. Uh, Trill Lakes hatchery is located in the <coughs> Pass, it's about 30 minute drive out of uh, Seward, Alaska. Uh, again, it's our main uh, sockeye producer. We do 6.9 million fry, uh, 2.35 million smolts, and we also do a token amount of coho salmon, uh, 450,000 fry and 50,000 coho smolts. Uh, this is Upper Trails Lake. You would think that we have, since we have this nice lake right nearby, that we would put fish into there and they would come back there, but we don't. Uh, we end up taking all our broodstock, or our other releases go to remote locations and therefore all our broodstock collection is also at remote locations. We have four broodstock programs, uh, the Bear Lake and the Hidden Lake I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with. Uh, the Shell Lake program is uh, relatively new for us. Um, usually Shell Lake had uh, anywhere from 40 to 60,000 adult uh, salmon returning, sockeye salmon returning. Uh, we've been monitoring that lake for some time and we were seeing a decline in the numbers down to like 100 to 200 adults coming back uh, with the main culprit being uh, Northern Pike. Uh, but also when we were starting to look at it more seriously, we also saw this loma that uh, uh, the BC people have also commented on as well. Uh, the English Bay stock is a totally different one and, and we use a totally different uh, method in terms of using lensing bags and salt water to rear those fish. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Um, we do, at Frontier Lakes, uh, nine remote release sites. Uh, 
the Hazel Leisure and Kirshner, uh, all here on the lower in the lower Cook Inlet, are barrier lake releases. Uh, the Res Bay and Tucker Bay Lagoon Smolt and the Port Graham Smolt are all short term marine in net pens uh, before they're getting released. Uh, the Bear Lake uh, program is it's actually just outside of Seward. It's about eight miles. It's uh, pretty convenient to get to. Uh, we've been enhancing that area since 1989. The state had been involved in that prior to that. Uh, the lake is a uh, spawning habitat limited. There's a very uh, short area here, small area here, uh, where we, the fish will actually spawn. The rest of the lake is pretty barren with a very limited habitat. Uh, all the fish that we put in here are hatchery produced and same with all the fish that come back. We have a very limited uh, wild uh, production out of there. Uh, we get about 98% of the fish being hatchery produced. Uh, each year we put 2.4 million fry into these lakes and what we were finding is we were just putting the lake or the fish into the lake and waiting for the adults to come back. They would come back up to the weir that we have a weir down at, at the outlet of uh, Bear Lake and we were putting 13,000 fish up there. What we were finding is the fish wouldn't come. We couldn't find the fish when it came time to collect food stock. Uh, either they were going somewhere else that we couldn't find them, or if we did have to find them, we had to uh, sing around quite a bit to catch the fish and prolong our intakes quite a bit. So what we started doing is actually taking the fry and putting them into small net pens in the creek and taking advantage of uh, some homing ability, uh, basically to acclimate these fish to uh, the tributary creek so they would come back to that. Generally, it's a 24-hour time period, but sometimes we go up to 48. The fish remain in the lake for one to two years before they go out. Uh, we enumerate them at the weir. Uh, the fish leave usually in May, June, and also the adults come back in May, June. Uh, so we have an overlap of both the uh, fry and the stolts, or, or sorry, the adults coming back. Uh, we allow 13,000 fish to go into the lake. Uh, it's at a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, generally, four to five thousand of those will be what we actually use for brood stock. Uh, since we've moved to the acclimation, we actually <coughs> find all the fish nicely queue up to the uh, mouth of the creek. Uh, we see that happening in about late July, and we'll put up a double weir system and allow the fish to get caught in the in between the two traps and collect them from there and put them into the smaller net pens uh, if they're right for uh, egg take the next day. Uh, unlike uh, the other programs that you heard about yesterday from uh, Kodiak and elsewhere, is um, we do delayed fertilization rather than fertilization on site. So we follow the same protocols in terms of disinfection and everything, but instead of uh, fertilizing and water hardening on site, we will actually take the uh, gametes and transfer them to the hatchery uh, to do the uh, uh, water hardening there. Uh, since we've uh, done this program and switched to the acclimation to the creek, uh, we have been able to collect six to six of the six million eggs that we need in seven to ten days uh, versus the 20 to 25 days that it was taking. And even on sometimes we weren't even making a target call. Second system I'm going to talk about is Hidden Lake. Uh, Hidden Lake is located in the Kenai Wildlife Refuge. Uh, it's about a 35, 45 minute drive uh, to Kenai. Uh, because it is in the Wapenda Refuge, we do require some cooperation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as ADF and G. Uh, this lake is also habitat, or spawning habitat limited, uh, but the lake has a tremendous food source potential. Uh, just to give you an idea, the Bear Lake smolts come out at 3 to 4 grams and the Hidden Lake smolts come out at 25 grams. Uh, if they're an H2 fish, they're coming out at 40. So it's quite a big difference in, uh, in capabilities between the two uh, lakes. Uh, because of the food source, uh, it was identified in the late 70s as a uh, a location and a kill candidate for some enhancement work by doing some additional fry stocking. Uh, it does have a wild population and it is uh, genetically distinct. Uh, 
What we do is we collect broodstock, take the gametes, rear them in the hatchery up until emergence, and we release them back into the lake as unfed fry. Uh, so basically from the time they're stocked uh, to the time they return, they're under the same uh, environmental conditions and predation issues that the uh, wilds, uh, wild fish would have as well. So. Um, because if there is a wild stock, we do have to meet some nice stipulations, and those are to have a ratio of wild to uh, hatchery fish returning, uh, being one to one. Uh, no strain to the other water bodies, which is like Skelac Lake and Kenai Lake. Uh, no more than 30,000 fish to return to the lake. And we also need to do uh, limnology monitoring to ensure that we're not having any negative impact uh, on the food source. Uh, we've been monitoring the strays for quite some time. Uh, as, uh, going to all the different wa other water bodies, looking around, and we have not been able to find uh, any hidden lake uh, hatchery reared fish in those systems. Uh, we've been monitoring the limnology also basically from the beginning as well and <coughs> have noticed, uh, haven't noticed any impact uh, based on the extra fish that we're adding into the system. <coughs> uh, we did have some issues earlier in terms of keeping the returns down to the 30,000 number. Um, what we have done then to help with that problem is we switched to a four-year average uh, to help us with the uh, survivals to back calculate how many eggs we're gonna take. Uh, and that has proven to be pretty successful. Generally, we're pretty good at uh, dialing in the number for the uh, 30,000 fish return. What we've had the biggest challenge with is the one to one. Uh, like the uh, Bear Lake, we do have a smolt trap. And when the fish go out as smolts, uh, we're able to trap those fish, to do a count, and also determine the contribution of the hatchery versus the wild stock. When the smolts are leaving, they're pretty close to one to one. Uh, generally, the uh, wild or hatchery fish is about 55%, and the uh, wild fish are about 45%. But when they return, it's not the same story. You would think it would be that you got 50 50 going out, you should have 50 50 coming back. And actually, what we're seeing uh, is the um, hatchery fish are having a better ocean survival uh, than the wild fish. So to help minimize the uh, interaction um, that the returning hatchery fish may have on the wild stock, uh, we're looking at a, taking advantage again of the homing ability of the sockeye salmon to um, help with that issue. Prior to 2012, what we were doing is we were collecting uh, the eggs in this side, in the western basin on the south side. And then when it came time to releasing the result of the progeny, we were taking them over to the north side. Uh, ADFG did a study, and what we found is that where we released the fish and, and was where the main area that they returned to. Uh, so taking advantage of this, and then also the fact that the eastern region has uh, pretty poor uh, spawning habitat, and well as the western habit or western basin has a lot better habitat for spawning, um, what we've done is started a new release program. So instead of releasing the fish up here, we're now releasing the fish down here in the eastern basin. Uh, the idea behind this is that the fish that are hatchery will return to the primarily to the eastern basin and where there's poor, poor habitat, so they won't be able to spawn uh, successfully, whereas those that are the wild fish will go to the western basin and where the habitat's better and therefore have a better success. Uh, 2015 was the first year that we got these fish back. Uh, you can see here we've been monitoring for some time. Um, there's been very few fish caught in the eastern region, mainly because we weren't stocking there. It was just fish that got away from them when we were transferring from the truck to the boat. But in 2015, uh, we were able to ca uh, capture, uh, or collect, sorry, 223 uh, fish for all the sampling. Of that, 98% of them were the hatchery <coughs> fish, and 2% were uh, the uh, wild stock. Uh, you see here in the western north region, we we're still getting a large influence of uh, hatchery fish, but that's primarily due to the stocking program prior, where we're still getting one threes, two twos, and the two threes back 
Uh, so we would expect to see uh, this to drop off and be somewhat similar to what we're seeing in the southern region, uh, where they're getting about a 30 to 70 percent split. Um, we were expecting to be able to dial this in a little better in terms of 2016 to see if this uh, trend continued. Uh, but unfortunately, 2016 was a terrible year for sockeye returns. Uh, we barely <coughs> got it. We only got like, instead of our 30,000 that we would like, we only got 1,300. Uh, so it's pretty hard to determine uh, where exactly those fish were and whether were, who they probably were, whether they were hatchery fish or, or uh, wild fish. Um, so basically that's just a couple ideas of how we've used sort of the natural uh, homing ability of the fish to help us uh, improve some of our uh, programs in terms of reach out. <coughs>